Hi, so hello everyone, myself Dr. Karthik Diyutla, I'm an anesthesiologist and in today's lecture we'll learn about something known as complex regional pain syndrome or also known as CRPS. In the recent MD-DNB examinations, this question as CRPS 1 and 2 is being asked multiple times. So we'll learn about this today without wasting much time. Get started. So what is complex regional pain syndrome? So CRPS as we talk about the definition, it is a clinical disorder that is characterized by severe continuous pain in the affected extremity, which is accompanied by sensory, vasomotor, pseudomotor and motor or trophic changes. So what are these changes? When it comes to the definition or the name complex, why is it complex? Because many different problems have been identified in people with CRPS, which we'll be learning later. Then why it is regional? The symptoms of CRPS are almost always confined to a particular region in the body. For example, you can take hand, foot, leg or arm. So it is confined regionally. Then pain. CRPS pain is very painful, very severely painful. It is a syndrome. A syndrome is a pattern of symptoms that often occur together. So CRPS is a syndrome. The complex regional pain syndrome is a chronic neurological condition resulting from a traumatic insult. Usually it is followed by a trauma. There are two types of CRPS which are determined by the involvement of a direct nerve injury. So what is type 1 and type 2 CRPS? In type 1, which accounts for 90% of the patients with CRPS, it is associated with the absence of a direct injury to the peripheral nerve. There is no direct nerve injury. This is also known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, RSD. When it comes to type 2 CRPS, it is associated with direct injury to a peripheral nerve. There is injury in type 2. There is no injury in type 2, type 1. So type 2 is also known as causalgia. Causalgia. Now let, let us know what are the causes for CRPS. There are five main causes when we divide it. First one is trauma like crush injuries, fractures and sprains. These are the most common cause for CRPS. Then there comes traumatic amputations. Then there are surgical causes like direct tissue or nerve damage by the surgeon during any procedure. Then there comes the neurological causes like a cerebrovascular accident resulting in the post hemiplegic dystrophy. Then nerve damage by any tumor invasion. All right. Then there are visceral causes like the myocardial infarction. Then there are vascular causes also like frostbite and thrombosis. Now moving on to pathogenesis of CRPS. See actually the etiology of CRPS is currently unclear yet even to, till the current date. There are many hypotheses made and many animal studies are there on this pathophysiology. So according to what has already been dealt with, both peripheral and central mechanisms are thought to play a role in the initiation and maintenance of CRPS. So first thing, let us talk about peripheral mechanisms or peripheral sensitization. So whenever there is a tissue trauma, like after tissue trauma, the primary afferent pain fibers in the injured area, they release several proprioceptive neuropeptides like substance P, bradykinin, interleukin 2, interleukin 5, or the tumor necrosis uh, factor TNF alpha. So all this will cause an increased background firing of the nociceptors. As you can see in this picture, the trauma site is in the finger. You can see the afferents going to the spinal cord, then to the brain, then again through the spinal cord, they are again the efferents are coming and there the person experiences pain and the, the stimulus, there is a stimulus and there is a response. This is known as peripheral sensitization. So due to this, there is increased firing in response to the nociceptive stimuli, which is called as hyperalgesia. And also there is a decreased firing threshold for the thermal and mechanical stimuli. For the thermal and mechanical stimuli especially, which is known as allodynia. The hyperalgesia and allodynia are one of the distinguishing features for CRPS. Okay. Then let us move on to central sensitization. The persistent or intense noxious input resulting from the tissue damage or nerve injury triggers increased excitability of the nociceptive neurons in the spinal cord. There is increased excitability in the nociceptive, the pain neurons in the spinal cord. 
This is again mediated by substance P, bradykinin, and the excitatory amino acid, which is NMDA, N-methyl D-aspartic acid receptors. So this will result in an increased excitability of the spinal cord neurons that is about by repeated brief mechanical or thermal stimulation, which occurs at a frequency which is similar to the natural firing rate of the pain receptors or pain fibers. This is known as wind up. This phenomena is known as winding up and this wind up is exaggerated in patients with CRPS. So this is known as central sensitization. And next theory is altered cutaneous innovation after injury. Whenever there is an injury, so, uh, there are many studies made on this and Albrecht et al made a study in about the pathological alterations of the cutaneous innovation and vasculature in the affected limbs from the patients with CRPS and they have found out that there is a reduced density of the CE fibers and A delta fibers in the CRPS affected region and also there is altered innovation of the hair follicles and sweat glands in the CRPS affected limb. Alright, then there is also altered sympathetic nervous system function. There are animal studies which indicate that after nerve trauma, the adrenergic receptors are expressed on the nociceptive fibers, the catecholamines. They are providing one mechanism by which the sympathetic nervous system outflow might directly trigger the nociceptive signals. This phenomena is known as sympathoafferent coupling, sympathoafferent coupling which is related to the sympathetic nervous system. Then there are also influence of the circulating catecholamines from the adrenal glands then there are also genetic factors then brain plasticity is also playing a role here by causing a reduced representation of the crps affected limb in the somatosensory cortex all right then the psychological factors also play a very important role so why we are uh, knowing about all this is the treatment or prevention of crps after a trauma or injury will depend on the exact pathophysiological mechanisms what we have just studied now. So the patient has present, uh, had an injury, then how does he present if he has CRPS? Let us know about the clinical presentation. Usually there is a triad which is pain, trophic changes and vasomotor disturbances. Train, trophic, pain, trophic changes and vasomotor disturbances. Now this uh, the criteria for uh, diagnosing CRPS is given by Budapest criteria, which includes four main criteria. And the first one is a continuous pain, which is disproportionate to an inciting event. Initially, the person will have pain only at the site of injury, but slowly the pain becomes burning type, shooting type pain, which radiates to the arm. Then it, radiate, it can radiate to the whole body also. It is a burning and shooting type of pain, which is always disproportionate to the uh, injury which occurred to that person and the second thing is the, they must report at least one symptom in three of the four following categories one symptom at least what are those sensory they must report hyperesthesia or allodynia hyperesthesia or allodynia what is allodynia where you will feel pain for the things where you usually don't pain, feel pain for example when you're sleeping and the bed sheet touches your feet then also you will feel pain, which is known as allodynia. Ha then the vasomotor uh, symptoms like temperature asymmetry, the temperature of the CRPS limb is usually warmer or warmer than the temperature of the other limb. And there is also skin color changes. There is also skin color asymmetry. All right. Then there are pseudomotor changes. There is swelling and edema of the affected limb. Then there are motor or trophic changes. You can see changes in the hair nail hair growth skin uh, the nature the character of the skin is also different then the muscle tone also is different there is dystonia there are tremors there is weakness of the muscle okay all these changes can be seen in crps and also they must display at least one sign a time of the evaluation in two or more of the following categories one sign which is all, again sensory which is hyperalgesia to pinprick or allodynia similarly like deep pressure deep touch or joint movements can be seen when it comes to vasomotor there is a it should be evidence of temperature asymmetry or skin color changes as we discussed before then there are pseudomotor or edema that is swelling or any sweating changes should be noted then the motor changes again like the trophic changes like hair changes nail changes and also motor weakness or dystonia should be seen 
if all these are not there there should be no other diagnosis that better explains the signs and symptoms of the patient after the injury then it will be decided as crps all right okay then this patient came to you the main thing is history and physical examination you make the diagnosis by eliciting the history and physical examination they form the main corner stone for the diagnosis of crps actually no diagnostic test is considered definitive for crps but there are few tests which are usually done and these tests are thermography which is one of the common and basic diagnostic method to measure the temperature of the affected limb the changes of more than 1 degree centigrade is considered to be significant then there are also other tests like bone scintigraphy mri radionucleotide bone scans okay then vascular studies electrodiagnostic techniques these all are also being used to help in the diagnosis of crps then there can be electromyography studies which are useful in certain populations because the myoclonus that presents in the crps patients is thought to be distinct from other types of myoclonus caused by other uh, diseases all right so what are some differential diagnoses for crps it can be post herpetic neuralgia polyneuropathy raynaud's phenomena rheumatological diseases radiculopathy then motor neuron diseases myofascial pain syndromes munchausen syndrome which is a psychiatric syndrome then acrocyanosis and fibromyalgia all these patients also do present with similar features as like as crps now let us move quickly on to the treatment so how do you prevent crps because preventing crps is the major objective here all right rather than treating because there is no permanent cure for crps uh, and the psychological and physiotherapy rehabilitation plays a very important role in the treatment so like uh, treating the cause treating the symptom or sign if we talk about sensory for pain we'll give neuropathic drugs like gabapentin okay then uh, the drugs in the who analgesic ladder like nsaids then we give tens then we give acupuncture psychology okay coming to the vasomotor changes it is due to sympathetic activity so we can do sympathetic blockade by giving certain blocks then talking about pseudomotor changes there is inflammation and edema so we have to give supplement with steroids and anti inflammatory drugs then there are motor or trophic changes for motor dysfunction we have to do physiotherapy and a lot a lot of occupational therapy and for osteoporosis which is developing we can give sodium chloronate or bisphosphonates all right there are two control studies which have shown that stellate ganglion blockade or vitamin c which acts as a oxygen free radical antagonist given at more than 500 mg per day can help to prevent the onset of crps in some patients so for prevention we are using vitamin c and stellate ganglion block physiotherapy plays a very important role physical rehabilitation and physiotherapy have been shown to reduce the pain and improve function in patients with crps the goal is to have the patient improve the functionality and the range of motion of the extremity and achieve reduction in the pain and increased mobility because patients tends to avoid the use of the affected limb due to that pain which he is having so physiotherapy and rehabilitation are going to play a major role then there comes the neuropathic medications like amitriptyline and gabapentin and carbamazepine coming to anti inflammatory medications we have non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs which are nsaids which are more beneficial in the studies and show have shown that they are more beneficial in the initial days of crps then comes the bisphosphonates steroids like methylprednisolone but long term use of steroids obviously comes with some cons it has some side effects then we have sympathetic nerve block as crps is thought to be related to autonomic dysregulation sympathetic nerve block has shown to relieve the pain to a major extent in many population so if it is a lower extremity crps we'll give lim- lumbar sympathetic block and for upper extremity crps we have to give stellate ganglion block or ivra or byers block can be given for the upper extremity then there also uh, done is invasive techniques like spinal cord stimulation which is electrical stimulation on the dorsal column of the spinal cord which is thought to mask the sensation of pain and the perceived pain is 
reduced to the patient. And there is also dorsal root ganglion stimulation method, which is also an invasive method. And also the studies have shown that reduction of allodynia in patients with CRPS is one study. And the prolonged analgesic effect of ketamine, which is an NMDA inhibitor in patients with chronic pain. These two studies have showed that ketamine uh, by acting as an NM on the NMDA receptors, it is going to reduce the pain. So ketamine, a non-competitive NMDA antagonist, may be effective for the pain relief in patients with chronic CRPS who are resistant to other therapies as NMDA receptor is a key component of the central sensitization mechanism of CRPS. Then surgical intervention like amputation of that limb. Amputation should be considered when there is an uncontrolled infection or ischemia. Amputation for pain relief is often unsuccessful because the majority of the, of the patients develop phantom limb pain again after am amputation, which is very true. Then we have transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS. It is a simple non-invasive and safe technique. Therefore, it is always worth considering as an adjunct to the medical treatment. Then there are other methods like acupuncture and psychotherapy also playing a role in CRPS treatment. Now, the major thing is what are the anesthetic considerations? If a patient with history of CRPS and injury have come to you posted for an elective surgery, what is your indication? What are your considerations? So studies suggest that pre and the post-operative treatment with calcitonin or vitamin C may reduce the risk of developing CRPS after a procedure or mitigate the recurrent post-operative exacerbations of CRPS. Now, if surgery is necessary in the limb affected with CRPS only, then it should be deferred if possible for one year after active symptoms have been subsided. Now, if the patient has CRPS type 2, Surgery may be considered if the benefit of correcting the nerve injury exceeds the risk of provoking a CRPS exacerbation. We, are, we already know that CRPS type 2, there is a direct peripheral nerve injury. So if you are correcting that nerve injury, then it is very good. It is, go, it is good to consider doing the surgery. Then the surgical approach should always be minimally invasive because you want to minimize the soft tissue and heart tissue injury and subsequent inflammation and more pain to the patient. Now, use multiple uh, multimodal analgesia, which is effective for the pain relief in these patients, like NSAIDs, acetaminophen, steroids, ketamine, and alpha-2 agonists like clonidine and dexmedetomidine have also have a role in the analgesic effect in CRPS. Ketamine is often used intraoperatively as an analgesic and should be considered for the intraoperative use in patients with CRPS. All right. So this brings us to the end of the topic. So I conclude by saying that complete recovery from CRPS is rare and the treatment should be focused mainly on the primary outcomes like pain relief or improving the functionality. So I hope this discussion was useful to you. And if you like the video, do press the like button and subscribe to the channel. And uh, I'll be doing more videos on exam topics and the topics which are difficult to understand and more important case presentations in this OT clinic session. So keep doing, uh, keep following, do subscribe and click the bell icon to get notified whenever we post a new video. So we'll see you in the next session. Thank you.